good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the last session of the International Conference Genome Editing in Europe New Agenda on New Disputes. This is actually um, the second part of the session four uh, with the title Regulation of GEOs in the EU and Worldwide. My name is Johannes Fritsch. I'm from the Leopoldina um, head office and I will be the host of this session. Um, we will now hear more about GMO regulation in the Western Hemisphere with a focus on the genome additive plants as in all the conference and um, yeah, as in all sessions before the, the public audience can ask questions in the Q&A section which is on the lower part of your um, Zoom window and you will try to sort and summarize the questions in the end of the session and uh, address these to the panel. And um, with that, I'd like to hand over the session to the chair, Professor Hans-Georg Gederer, who is a chair of constitutional and administrative law, public international law and European and international economic law at the University of Passau in Germany. We've heard from Professor Dedera before in session one and three, and he's also or has been a member of the uh, interdisciplinary experts working group of Leopoldina, the German Science Academies and the German Research Foundation that published um, this statement in the end of last year. Um, it has been mentioned before. It has actually the title towards a scientifically justified differentiated regulation of genome edited plants in the EU and provides very concrete um, yes, yeah, solutions, how to deal with these problems we are um, tackling during this conference. And um, hereby, I give the stage to Professor Dera, please. So, thank you very much, Dr. Fritsch. Um, and welcome to all of you to our last session, that is part two of session four. Uh, concerning regulation of genome edited organisms in the EU and worldwide. Um, well, today or in this, uh, this afternoon session, uh, we will hear three distinguished experts from Argentina, the United States and Canada. Three very interesting countries as regards the regulation of GMOs, geno uh, uh, genetically modified organisms, but of course also genome edited organisms. Um, Argentina claims to be the first country or the country which uh, was the first country to adopt uh, le legislation or regulation that is specific uh, or was specifically designed to regulate genome edited organisms. So we are very glad to hear a very brief uh, country report from Argentina by Martin Lema. And we'll also hear a very brief introduction to the U.S. regulatory system by uh, Peggy Grossman. Uh, the United States um, um, uh, is claimed to be a country which uh, based its biotechnology regulation on the so-called product approach. That leads us back to what uh, Pete van der Meer said in the session this morning. Uh, in the end of the 1980s, last century, there was a big discussion how to regulate genetic engineering in the European Union. And uh, one approach was the process based approach and one approach was the product based approach and was always claimed the United States follow a product based approach, whereas Europe follows a process based approach. But when we go into some more detail, then we will see that all that this is a not really a black white distinction. Uh, it's somewhat nebulous. If we go into some detail, we'll see in Europe that the regulation is also a little bit product based. And when we look into more detail into the US, I think the regulation is also a little bit process based. Canada claims, I think, to be the country which has a real product-based uh, regulation, a real science-based and product-based regulation, and this is due to the regulation of uh, seeds, which um, and the trigger for regulation is uh, novel trade. So we'll be really interested in getting information on the Canadian system uh, by Stuart Smythe. Um, so 
I think we should start our, uh, our, after this very brief introduction, our talks. The first speaker will be Professor Martin Lima, who is professor in the Biotechnology School of the National University of Quilmes in Argentina. Uh, what is very important is that he has also experience as a policymaker in agricultural biotechnology. So he was, uh, was and is heavily involved in actively regulating um, in actively regulating um, genetically modified organisms and also genome edited organisms. Please, Martin, the floor or the screen rather is yours. Thank you, Hans George. Uh, and I would uh, also like to thank Leopoldina for this opportunity. And uh, hello, everybody. Uh, now I'm going to, to share with you some of the Argentine experience in the regulation of gene editing applied to agriculture. So, first of all, our approach, that's it. First of all, oh, first of all our approach, the core of our, of our approach is based on the LMO definition of the Cartagena protocol, which is also the GMO definition for the Argentine regulation. These are the two main de definitions in the Cartagena Protocol explaining what is an, an LMO and therefore a, a GMO for us. These definitions had a lot of redundancy and some aspects that are not relevant to this discussion. So the, the most important part of, of them uh, is uh, highlighted here. And if we can compact these uh, concepts, we end up uh, with the conclusion that a GMO or a, an, a, an LMO is an organism that possesses, first of all, a novel combination of genetic material, and that co novel combination of genetic material has been obtained through the use of recombinant DNA or the direct injection of nucleic acid into cells, as well as other considerations that may be relevant in, in some cases. So with, with this in mind, uh, we can uh, produce like a map uh, where in two dimensions we plot the different technologies that use molecular biology in one way or another for, in, for the genetic improvement or breeding uh, of new animals, for animals, plants or microorganisms for agriculture. In this uh, map you can see on the horizontal dimension uh, different degrees of change to the DNA sequence from techniques that doesn't change the DNA sequence at all to techniques that uh, generate the insertion of, of, a, of a piece of DNA, a foreign piece of DNA. And, and in between, of course, you have techniques that only make uh, small mutations. Um, and then on the vertical dimension, you have techniques grouped by the different usage of recombinant DNA. Some techniques do not use recombinant DNA at all in contact with the organism. It, it use, they, they use them as a satellite uh, activity, but not uh, the, the recombinant DNA is never in contact with the organism. Then some techniques do use recombinant DNA in contact with the organism, but it is uh, uh, not present in the final product. And finally, we have technologies that do integrate uh, foreign recombinant DNA in the organism. With this, uh, we can, as I said, map the different technologies, and this helps us to draw a line between what would be an, a GMO or an LMO, uh, taking into account the two um, um, rules uh, of these uh, definitions, novel combination and use of recombinant DNA, and techniques that may not be considered LMO or GMO. Mm -hmm. So with this uh, core criteria, uh, we developed um, uh, an analysis and decision-making process that is summarized in, in this slide. Uh, we take into account uh, if the product has uh, been developed with the use of molecular biology or recombinant DNA as a, um, as a trigger for the developer to approach the government and ask the government if the product is considered a GMO or not. So the last part of, of the decision-making process uh, is, or the, or the central part of it, of it, is to decide if the product has a new combination of genetic material or not. This decision-making process can handle both final products that are uh, completely characterized and ready to enter the market, or products that are under development. And uh, it also uh, creates a communication between regulators of GMOs and regulators of conventional products 
that some, somehow mind the gap between these two regulatory systems. This, um, this uh, graph shows us uh, how Argentina has been taking major decisions on biotech uh, organisms for agriculture over time. In blue, you have the approval of GMOs uh, since 1996, uh, mostly crops, but also some GMO vaccines. And as you can see, uh, it is always increasing at, at a certain uh, variable speed. But then in 2015, we, we had this, this new regulation for genome edited and enacted. And 2016, we, we started to take decisions pertaining if products uh, modified by genome editing were GMO or not. And the amount of decisions uh, is increasing more, more steadily. So this, the, not only because it's uh, easier or it takes less time to determine if something is GMO or not, compared to the uh, safety assessment of a GMO, but also because we have far more applicants presenting their products. Uh, if we analyze the products uh, from new breeding, the so-called new breeding techniques presented to this uh, regulatory me mechanism, as you can see in the pie chart here, most of them are gene edited, but, but there are some others that uh, have been modified by other techniques, like for instance, epigenetic modification. And the, if we group them by trait and by the biological kingdom, we can see that there is a lot of diversity in, in both uh, dimensions. I mean, we have products in animals, plants, and microorganisms, and also uh, quite an interesting distribution between different kinds of traits for different purposes, um, traits, of, traits for basic agricultural interest, traits for consumer preference, for industrial use, very various. If we compare to the universe of GMOs that have been commercially approved, that's the, that's the graph on the lower right, you can see that the diversity is much, uh, is much reduced, no animals, few microorganisms. And as regards to crops, Mostly we have blockbusters. This is uh, maize and soybean with uh, in herbicide tolerance or insect pest protection. We call them blockbusters because these are products that can be sold almost anywhere in the world to farmers. They can be sold to farmers almost anywhere in the world. And that's uh, mostly the kind of products we get in the GMO universe. But in, in the gene edited or new brain techniques universe, we get them um, uh, a more important diversity that could also um, deliver new technologies to some agricultural chains or production chains that are local or of lesser uh, dimension. It is a comparison uh, of the applicant's profile. On the right, you have products from New Green Techniques, which are mostly genome editing. And as you can see, more than half of products uh, are coming from pub Argentine public research or Argentine biotech companies. And uh, pertaining the other half, most of that other half is coming from abroad, but for uh, medium enterprises. And of course, the, the system is not excluding multinational companies, uh, and they are present uh, to a certain extent. Uh, if we compare this to the profile of applicants for GMO products, the situation is completely reversed. Historically, we have only the deregulation. In Argentina, as in many other countries, we have the deregulation of uh, multinational companies, and it's very difficult for local developers and, and national researchers to, to deregulate a, a product. So, <clears throat> in, these are a um, few examples of these uh, Argentine developments that came to the, com to the Biosafety Commission, to the government, and the government say this product is not GMO. This is an example of uh, coming from our National Institute of Agricultural Technology on crops. This is a startup company that was created in Argentina solely to develop genome edited crops because the regulation in Argentina and some neighbor countries is a, uh, is, uh, is, uh, working in the same way, open to have a clarity on the, uh, on the status, legal status of these products. And also we have now, um, uh, we have here in the screen an, Ar an important Argentine seed company that uh, didn't have until now uh, biotechnology of its own, 
but now it, it has invested in having a biotechnology, a molecular biology lab uh, in order to develop uh, gene edited varieties of, of its own property. Uh, in here, we return to the National Institute of Agricultural Technology. They are also working in gene editing of animals, in this case, for a consumer benefit trade. And this is another example for, from a medium Argentine company that historically has been working on assisted reproduction techniques. And now it's using that capability to also develop genome edited animals. And perhaps I, in, in a moment, I skipped uh, mentioning something. You, you may barely, you, you, perhaps you saw a map uh, in here, sorry. In here, you can see a map. Uh, in 2015, co coincidental with the timeline, in 2015, only Argentina had this kind of regulation in, in the whole world. But now, five years later, an, another seven countries in Latin America have very similar regulations and they are also taking decisions. We have decisions like the one I have described in, right now in Chile, in Brazil. And last uh, week, I think, uh, Colombia announced that they have um, they have decided that the um, genome edited um, rice uh, is not a, a GMO. So this is the current situation in, in Argentina and, and succinctly in the rest of Latin America. Um, thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Martin, for this excellent presentation and overview. It was a very good brief introduction into your regulatory system. So I would like to introduce the next speaker, actually, from the United States, Professor Marco Grosso Grossman, who is book chair emerita and prof professor of agricultural law emerita in the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Economics at the University of Illinois. Well, um, Margaret actually published extensively, not only in agricultural law, but of course also in agricultural biotechnology law. And so we're very happy actually to have you here as the leading expert, I would say, in the United States on agricultural biotechnology law. So please, Margaret, go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm very glad to be here this afternoon and, and appreciate being invited to this, this conference. Um, I'm going to talk about um, GEO regulation in the United States, um, but I want to start with some regulatory background um, and, uh, and then I'll focus on new regulations that were enacted just this year. So our regulation of GMOs, and we're referring to it as genetic engineering now, um, dates from 1986 and the focus was our DNA technology. Um, authorization comes from the United States Department of Agriculture, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Food and Drug Administration. And we're going to focus today on the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the USDA. Um, okay, so the U.S. Department of Agriculture um, works from an organization called APHIS, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service and its biotech regulatory services. The Plant Protection Act authorizes the regulation of plant pests. So one of the focuses is, is the GE crop a plant pest? The regulation is dated from 1987, but now we have a new rule. It's called the Secure Rule from May 2020. Um, the Secure Rule refers to sustainable ecological, consistent, uniform, responsible, and efficient um, regulation. And again, the focus is on plant pest risk. And I've put a little definition there. The plant pest is any living plant and other things that can directly or indirectly injure, cause damage, or cause disease in a plant or plant product. The regulations are at seven Code of Federal Regulations. And they're phased in between um, August and the 1st of October, 2021. And the definition of genetic engineering is broad. Techniques that use recombinant, synthesized, or amplified nucleic acids to modify or create a genome. There are a number of provisions of the, the, these rules. Applicability, scope, definitions. There's a regular story status review that's important, permits, and some other provisions. 
And we'll focus on applicability because that's where um, the new rule focuses on GEOs. So this shows uh, um, how this system works very broadly. There's a system of exemptions and confirmations. There's a regulatory status review. And then there's a permitting system. And, um, and this slide indicates sort of the impact of each of these various stages. Um, and what we're going to focus on mostly now is the exemptions and confirmations that govern the GEOs. This is on the USDA's website, so it's easily available. So in the 2020 rule, GEOs constitute genetic engineering. It's really clear. APHIS has never taken the position that genome editing does not constitute genetic engineering because that would be inconsistent with generally accepted scientific characterization of genome editing. Um, but what the 2020 rule does is it codifies earlier USDA policy for GEOs, a policy statement from March 2018. Um, and it also ends a procedure called Am I Regulated, in which those who develop new products could send a letter to USDA and ask if they're regulated, and, um, and the USDA would respond. And, and there have been 166 of these. Slightly less than half have been GEOs, and most of them, um, the USDA has declined regulatory jurisdiction. So in March 2018, the biotech regulations, um, according to USDA, do not re currently regulate or have any plans to regulate plants that could have been developed through traditional breeding techniques, as long as they don't have a plant pest and they're not plant pests. And, and USDA claims to have carefully reviewed the products of these technologies to determine whether, determine whether they require regulatory oversight. And so what the 2020 rule does is essentially, it does a lot of other things too, but it codifies that USDA statement. So the, the March 2018 statement indicates that USDA does not plan to regulate deletions or single base pair substitutions. The 2020 rule exempts single deletions of any size and targeted single base pair substitutions. Okay, so it does focus on, um, on the singleness of these changes. If it's more than one change, um, then they don't fit within the exemption. Um, so again, the rule, the, the policy statement from 2018 um, says the USDA won't regulate insertions from compatible plant relative, relatives and complete null segregants. The 2020 rule, again, compatible plant relatives um, are exempted. What's interesting is that null segregants are not defined as exemptions because under the 2020 rule, null segregants do not retain modified DNA sequences, so they're simply not defined as genetic engineering under the 2020 rule. So you can see that the policy that was stated in 2018 is, is codified in the 2020 rule. And there was a lot of um, emphasis from policy statements from the government dating back to 2011 about that encouraged a more supple regulation for um, genetic engineering in general. So there are some other um, exemptions too. One is that there can be added additional modifications that could be achieved via conventional breeding. This is the kind of future proofing of the new rule. Um, and there is a regulatory process for adding exemptions and it will require um, public notice and opportunity to, to, um, to comment from the public. Um, other things that are not regulated are plant trait mechanism of action combinations that have been evaluated via regulatory status review, and we'll talk about that briefly, um, and determined not to be regulated, and things that were went through the whole permitting process and got non-regulated status under the 1987 rule. 
And those plants that aren't regulated under am I regulated that we talked about before are also exempt from following the provisions of the 2020 rule. One of the controversial aspects of this is that there's a process called self-determination in which developers decide if a new organism is exempt. There's no requirement of notice to APHIS, USDA, um, which has caused some comment and, and disagreement. But there is something that's referred to as a voluntary confirmation process. Um, the developer will send detailed information to APHIS and ask if APHIS agrees that the exemption applies. And if so, then APHIS will post a confirmation letter on its website. And, and um, USDA in its rules said this should help to market products both domestically and internationally. And there's also a guidance document for developers to, to tell them how to request a confirmation of, of exemption. Um, it's true that APHIS has, has noted that some GEOs will be regulated if they pose a plausible plant pest risk. So every GEO is, is not going to be um, exempt. If a GEO isn't exempt, and for other products that are, are exempt, um, there is a new process called the regulatory status review. And this replaces the complicated petition for determination of non-regulated status. It assesses the likelihood and magnitude of plausible plant pest risks. Um, interestingly, it does not require field trial data, although APHIS can request more data, including field trial, to assess, to assess risk. If APHIS, if APHIS does not find a, pla a plausible plant pest risk, then the GE plant is not regulated under the 2020 rule. But if there is a plausible plant risk pathway, the developer can request a more detailed review or can apply for a permit, or both sometimes. So permits are still in the system. And if the, uh, the regulatory status review found a likely risk of a plant pest, or it's not certain, or the developer wants a permit, or the GE organism fits in a regulated category, then there might be a permit. And there probably are reasons why developers would seek a permit, particularly in terms of, of, of trade. The regulated categories for a permit are a plant trait MOA that isn't evaluated and or held to need a permit, an organism that's defined as a plant pest, products for pharmaceutical or industrial use will always require a permit, and then there's a list of some non-plants or microorganisms with a plant pest risk. And for more information, um, I'm, I'm publishing an article in the European Food and Feed Law Review probably around the end of the year. It should be out. There are trade issues with all of this, I think. Um, the usual issues about asynchronous approvals and low level presence. Um, but in terms of generated organisms, particularly uh, a variety that isn't regulated in the United States, but is subject to GMO regulation in the EU um, will be a problem. Some of these varieties don't leave any markers, which is difficult. And then there are questions about labels, because it seems to me that under our bioengineered food label law, these GEOs will not require labels. And then traceability um, is going to raise some issues too. Regulatory systems differ. And of course, trade is subject to the rules of the importing country. And in the comments from the um, proposed rule, I think a lot of stakeholders actually feared trade disruptions. Will trading partners accept the US regulatory changes? APHIS is fairly optimistic about this. Trading partners have historically judged our approach to be acceptable because it's transparent and science and risk-based. And APHIS plans to provide technical expertise for trading partners about determinations of regulatory status 
And also, there's going to be a lot of public information available. There's an MOA table that's actually already on the website that gives information about deregulated, deregulated varieties and from the regulatory status reviews. And then the confirmation letters for exemptions are going to be posted. And that's particularly important for um, genome edited organisms. So kind of in conclusion, um, innovations in, in biotechnology will be, be important in the future for agricultural production. Um, we need to feed 9.7 billion people by 2050. We need to think about sustainability, climate resiliencies, and other issues. And it seems that precise, affordable technologies are going to be criti critical, and it's important that our regulatory policies be flexible and proportionate, adaptable to innovation, future-proof, sort of, and that they focus on the risk of the organism. And the 2020 rule is really intended to play a role in the future of biotechnology. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you so much, Peggy, for this very concise and brilliant talk about the uh, regulation of uh, genome edited organisms in the United States. But let's carry on before we ask questions. Uh, our last speaker for this afternoon will be uh, Professor Stuart Smythe. He is professor uh, in the Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics at the University of Saskatchewan. And there he holds the chair of Agri-Food Innovation and Sustainability Enhancement. And also he is a highly distinguished expert in the field of agrobiotechnology regulation in Canada, um, and of course also an expert in the field of GMO law in Canada. So, Stuart, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you, Hans George. It's good to see you again, and same for Margaret and Martin too. So thanks for the invitation to talk a little bit about how Canada regulates GMOs and, and gene edited products. Basically, Canada just simply adapted the existing regulatory framework it had for conventional crop varieties prior to, to GMOs. So between 1988 and 94, regulatory experts, government scientists, industry scientists, and academic scientists got together and, and commissioned some reports and looked at the literature, but essentially determined that the three acts that governed crop variety approvals in Canada at, at the leading up into the late 80s and early 90s could simply be adapted. And, and you can see the different aspects of risk that are assessed under the, the risk assessment process that Canada uses. So when it comes to gene editing regulation, the, the same three acts will be used to assess the potential for risk from any gene edited variety. Canada has approved two gene edited varieties, one by Cebus uh, that used ODM to insert herbicide tolerance. There's been very limited adoption over the last three or four years. And BASF had a herbicide tolerant variety commercialized a few years ago, but given the, the global mergers and, and acquisitions, uh, it's, it's a little bit uncertain as to how, how much Clearfield canola has actually been produced given the, the shifting of the Clearfield technology uh, from the Bayer Monsanto merger. So one of the ways that the industry in Canada has signaled some concerns to the regulatory agencies, the CFIA and Health Canada was that plant breeders were, and the industry were expressing some concerns about the application of novelty. So three years ago, a workshop was held by the, the three groups listed there as, as organizing it and, and really expressing the idea that there needed to be more definition of exactly what was novel, what could be done within the plant genome that would trigger or would not trigger novelty. This is particularly the case for the, the public institutions, the universities and, and public sector 
variety of development because at my university, for example, they don't develop anything that will be a PNT simply because our university doesn't have the capacity to have two parallel streams, one for non PNT varieties and one for PNT varieties. We're, our, our regular plant breeding system is, is taxed to the margins in terms of land availability, lab availability. So to have a separate parallel stream is just simply not economically feasible. And, and one of our plant breeders told me that, that really what drives all variety development is yield enhancement. And there's a great deal of uncertainty about what level of yield increase is going to trigger novelty and result in a PNT. And, and a couple of the breeders I've spoken to, and one in particular said that if they get a, a line of, of the crop that they're involved in developing, if the, the yield bump is over 20%, then they make sure that that variety doesn't go forward for commercialization because of concerns about it triggering a PNT. So, so this lack of definition about novelty is, is hindering uh, the development of, of truly innovative varieties because the varieties that are going forward will have lower yield increases than, than what might be the case. So the, since this workshop was held in 2017, Health Canada has initiated uh, and just concluded two years of, of roundtable discussions with industry. They're committed to having uh, public consultations that will begin in January with a, a full report or, or program provided by April. I did a survey in, with about 100 plant breeders, which is about 25% of the plant breeders in Canada two years ago, and, and asked them about their uses of, use of gene editing and also whether they viewed the existing PNT regulations as a, as a barrier to, to their research. So you can see that when we did this survey two years ago, a third of plant breeders in Canada were using it and two thirds expect to be using it at some point by next year. And most of the, the, the leading reason for the wish or the desire to use gene editing was it was going to create a simpler regulatory pathway for commercialization. And you can see that of the, the public plant breeders, public sector plant breeders that responded to the survey, 100% of them indicated that that, that was their uh, reason for adopting gene editing technologies. Yet, as we, as we pushed into the second aspect of, of the paper or of the research, you can see that plant breeders overwhelmingly hold the perspective that there needs to be a, a, a credible review of exactly what PNT regulations are and, and how novelty is going to be applied. And, and so you can start to see some of the costs creeping in due to the lack of regulatory certainty, one third of plant breeders had determined that if their variety was going to be a PNT, they, they ended research on that, on that, with that line. Um, just over 20% have had research proposals turned down due to uncertainty around PNT. And, and so this lack of clarity around what is going to be truly novel, because within the Canadian system, it doesn't matter what process was used to develop it, whether it was mutagenic breeding, genetic modification, or gene editing, what gets regulated, as Hans Dieter said at the end, is, is the seeds, the, the product at the end of the day is what gets regulated. The, the process is irrelevant. So to give you a bit of an idea that there's definitely some, some confusion about what is novel and there needs to be more clarity about that, we're finding that there's there's a definite barrier to the, the lack of novelty. And to, to give you an estimate as to what we think this could be costing the, the Canadian agriculture sector on an annual basis, there's somewhere between 800 and a, mil, and a billion dollars invested in ag R&D in Canada annually. And so with one third of breeders saying that they're ending or, or halting research programs, we sort of roughly estimate that could be a direct cost of 100 to 300 million dollars. And when these variety, these potential varieties are, are, are being halted, that are particularly higher yielding varieties, when we extend that to, to the farmer adoption of new varieties that, that are lower yielding than what the case might be, based on the, 
the annual value of, of crop production in Canada, we estimate that the farm level losses could, could be reaching a billion dollars annually. So, so this lack of certainty about what is novel, what is not novel, particularly as it relates to, to yield increases, is an, is an expensive barrier within the Canadian ag industry, costing somewhere between 1.1 and $1.3 billion annually. So thank you for the invitation, and I, I look forward to the questions for the, for the, for, for the panel. Well, thank you so much, Stuart, for this very, very interesting and in-depth analysis. Also a brief analysis, but an uh, analysis of your, um, of your regulatory framework and also the effects it has on innovation. That was really quite interesting. Um, but now I, I think I will hand over to Johannes Fritsch and he will read out some of the questions. Is that the case, Johannes Fritsch? Yes, thank you. Okay. So there have been uh, uh, several questions. Um, I try to sort them somehow. So there's a lot of um, questions around trade disruption and, and how you, you consider uh, the world trade being uh, major exporters also to Europe. So um, there's a general question to all three of you. Um, what are the implications of, of the, the, this way of um, regulating GMOs, GEOs in, in your own country and maybe also with a, with a peek to the European interpretation of how to regulate um, certain organisms that are not being uh, declared a GMO in your own country? And uh, there's one specific question in, in this area to Martin, um, if, if this even uh, it was. If this this view on the trade disruption plays a, a role in the in the process of um, um, yeah classifying uh, these these organisms um, as as a, as a GMO or not? So I guess you have you have this clear um, 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 process, but the, the question is if, if if with view on the trade possible trade disruption, if this this plays a role. Uh, this uh, process. So, Martin, do you want to start? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, I, I have uh, I have seen the both questions uh, as regards to the question by Dr. Detlef Barsh um, regarding um, public records on Chino merited products. Uh, as I have explained. Uh, with genome editing, you can produce different kinds of products. And the regulated articles in Argentina are GMOs. And the other articles are conventional varieties that also have their own regulation. Uh, so when we re, uh, analyze a product uh, modified by genome editing, what we do is to decide if it is a GMO or not. So and each one of those has its own registers. So either you will find them under the GMO regist registration process and, and public records, or you will find it under the conventional products registration and public records. We do not uh, recognize a third category, and therefore there is not a third uh, record of gene editor. So it's either uh, after the assessment is either a GMO or a non-GMO. Then the, the, the other question that was addressed to me by Dr. Hish Kletter um, is uh, about trade, the trade disruption, as he said. Uh, it's not easy now, right now to make a prediction of if there's going to be trade disruption. Uh, for instance, uh, in the case of GMOs, we, we did have trade disruption and we did have a WTO panel on GMOs. I was part of the Argentine team that, uh, that was um, defending the country inter interest in that panel. So in there, we, we did have trade disruption and, 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 and trade dispute. But more recently, uh, in regards to animal cloning, for instance, in Argentina, we had a very different Argentina, US, Brazil, uh, Australia, we had a, a certain uh, understanding of uh, the safety and other considerations pertaining animal cloning. In the EU, it uh, seems to be different. And that uh, was uh, perhaps also leading to a potential clash. But uh, in, the, in the end, at least uh, what, uh, what is, um, in regards to Argentine uh, users of the technology, they just decided not to use it in order to avoid any clash with the EU. So it's, 
in regards to Shino meriting, we're, we're a very, at a very um, initial uh, stance. Uh, we don't know how many of these products will be on the kind of crops that are exported to the European Union. But also, <clears throat> in, in my very personal view, the situation in the European Union is not clear. But even when there is this um, ruling by the European Court of, Just Court of Justice, uh, it has to be taken into account that uh, in the past, national authorities have a very different interpretation when they have to handle uh, applications for field trials. Also, we have a official uh, um, uh, scientific analysis uh, commissioned by European Commission that had a different interpretation. And um, finally, that the EU is not using the Cartagena Protocol definition. They are using a, a definition of, of their own. So if we are uh, heading to a trade dispute, uh, it may be because uh, Europe has to revise, didn't revise its own policies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin, for this explanation. I think there are questions to all our speakers. So um, we may choose questions to Margaret concerning the US regulatory system. Yes. Okay. Um, so, so uh, there was also this this question to all. How, how do you see implications for trade disruption? Uh, so the same question to Margaret. And uh, there are some specific questions to you. Um, for example, uh, what was the reasoning for this uh, self determination in this new 2020 regulatory approach? Um, and uh, there's a second one which just goes to the same um, direction. I think. To what extent does the new rule proposed by the EPA align with the rule already implemented by the USDA? Yeah, um, as to trade, I, I raised that kind of briefly in my slides, and I think, you know, because, because the importing country um, rules have to be followed, I think there could be some trade disruptions with, with um, genome edited. Um, crops. Um, so far, as far as I know, there's only one that's planted commercially in the United States. It's a Calix soybean and it's, it's, it's grown in a, a closed loop so that farmers will plant, plant and sell it to the company. And I read recently that there are some restaurants in Minneapolis that are now using that soybean oil. Um, but as far as I know, that's the only crop um, being produced commercially, so the trade problems are in the future, but I think the whole question of um, varieties that leave no markers and, and you know, the, the whole questions of labeling and traceability will be really, really difficult in the future, assuming that the EU doesn't um, create a more supple regulation. Now, the next question is, has to do with the self-determination and, and the purpose of that. Um, I think that, that the USDA decided that crops that are raised um, or, or bred com com in, in conventional breeding have been subject to very little oversight and that because the, the result is, is similar with GEOs that like products should be regulated alike. And, um, and the self-determination is really focused in part on regulatory relief when it seemed clear to USDA that there was, there was no harm to, to happen from these organisms. And also, um, it avoids a lot of redundant evaluation by USDA, so USDA can actually focus its emphasis on, um, on the, the crops that really do need careful evaluation. The other aspect of this is that in fact, APHIS believes that most developers will actually ask for a letter of confirmation, which is a kind of review because the, the, there will be details about the crop in, that, in the, the inquiry letter and um, USDA will have a chance to, to evaluate it. Um, the question about the Environmental Protection Agency and its proposed regulations um, just to give you some background, um, the Environmental Protection Agency governs genetically engineered organisms that carry pesticides, which they refer to as plant incorporated pet protectants, um, and it regulates under the, the pesticide law and residues in food are regulated under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. 
the regulation that was proposed at the beginning of September still hasn't appeared in the Federal Register. I've been looking for it every day. Um, but it, it proposes to exempt these plant incorporated protections based on sexually compatible plants created through biotechnology. That's the language from kind of the summary of that. Um, if there are no greater risks than safe PIPs and they could have been created through conventional breeding, they'll be exempted from regulation. Again, um, there is self-determination um, proposed by the EPA, but interestingly, the EPA requires developers either to report to the EPA or to request confirmation. So they propose an additional step that goes beyond what APHIS says has, um, has set in place. I think that's it. I think I got all those. Okay, thank you very much, Peggy, for this exhaustive explanation. Um, there's also a question to Stuart Smythe, actually, by Jens Kalman. I think we take that. Yeah. So um, the, there's two questions uh, to Stuart. So one is, do you have any suggestion how to more clearly define novelty without being completely arbitrary? And uh, the second question is, um, uh, let me see. I think it was about, um, I say that there it is. So what about food from P and T's that are not regulated elsewhere and uh, that are imported into Canada? Are there examples of any trade issues over this? You're still mute? Great, thanks for both those questions. So, so in response to the first one, what has been suggested is that novelty provide an exemption for existing traits and existing crops that have been, had risk assessments that conducted for up to 25 years. So for example, herbicide tolerance in canola, we commercialized the first varieties in 1995. So we've got 25 years of risk assessment with no evidence of ecological, environmental, human harm. So, so the idea would be is that if gene editing resulted in the development of another herbicide tolerant canola variety, it would be exempt. However, if a breeder was developing a, 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 a new trait within an existing variety or a, a new novel trait within a new variety, then that would undergo the full risk assessment. And in response to the second one, so what Canada does is, is we, our regulatory agencies do conduct risk assessments on crops and food products that could never be grown in Canada. So we've approved genetically modified papaya. Um, we've approved golden rice in case, in the example of rice, in case some rice coming, golden rice commingles with other rice, then if it's detected in an import into Canada, we've already conducted a risk assessment and, and approved it. So there are no trade disruptions. So the Canadian regulatory agency has been quite, um, quite realistic of potential trade disruptions and, and conducted risk assessments on, on crops that simply would never be grown within Canada, but, but certainly would be a common import. Okay, thank you. There, there are some very specific questions, if I may, or Professor Dera, you, you have a question? There's one question actually to all three speakers by Kai Furnhagen. Perhaps we may ask this question to the all three speakers. Are there any possibilities in the legal systems presented to take into account potential and yet unknown future benefits in the regulation of GMOs? So on the question, not about risks, but rather to benefits and how they are taken into account, even if they are only potential and yet unknown. Would anyone like to ask or give an idea? Margaret was first. Sure. Um, well, I, I mentioned in my, my um, slides that, that in the new USDA regulation, there is 
this future proofing that actually allows for new exemptions. And presumably that is to have a process so that that new GEOs, for example, things that could be achieved through conventional breeding um, can be accommodated in the system. Now, um, when you look at these regulations, um, they're, they're, the focus is really plant pest risks. There, there really isn't the focus on the social economic benefits from genetic, genetically modified organisms or genome edited organisms. So, so the regulation, I think, doesn't actually focus on benefits to focus on an analysis to determine if there's a plant pest risk. And that's the authority that USDA has. And I, I think our system is a little bit different in the sense that um, those social economic issues probably don't come into the regulatory decisions quite as much as they do in Europe. I'm not sure that that totally answers your question, Kai, but um, it's an attempt anyway. Kai, one of the things that, that we've seen in Canada is that the, the social aspects don't come into play. So I don't think, as Margaret said, I, I, I doubt that in Canada we would see a change in the science-based risk assessment to, to begin to, to bring that in. But when I've talked to, to companies that are, have submitted uh, GM varieties for, for risk assessment, what they're doing is they're taking some of the studies that have been done by academics that quantify environmental benefits, such as the reduction in tillage or the reduction in chemical use or those types of, of, of impacts. And the references to those studies get included in the, the compendium of data that, get, that gets submitted as part of the dossier for a risk assessment. So that information is being provided to regulators to say that herbicide tolerant varieties are, are reducing the impact on the environment, and, and here's the, the sort of the, the research from agricultural economists that have quantified some of that. So, so we do, or I've heard some evidence that that those aspects are are at least being included in the the submission dossiers for risk assessment. Great, thank you, Stuart. Would like to add? Yes, please. You're welcome. No, thank you, Carl. Thanks, George. Uh, well, um, uh, let, let me paraphrase something I have been saying and, and now something else. If, if a product, uh, GMO, genetic, whatever, if, if a product has a, a risk, uh, so, and we are talking here uh, of uh, sanitary regulatory regimes in, in, in any of, of, of our countries. So it's a sanitary regulatory regime. And if a product has a risk, you cannot compensate by a social or, or economic benefit. So that, that's it. Uh, only after a product has been assessed as safe, perhaps you can have pro and cons. For instance, in the GMO in Argentina, we have a socioeconomic or productive commercial assessment where we uh, uh, weight pairs and apples between the possibility of exporting to countries and the benefit. Some, sometimes countries have not approved the product and therefore we cannot export there. But at the same time, we may have more productivity and we outweigh the pears and apples. But that's a, a, an assessment on itself after the safety assessment uh, has been done. Uh, and as um, uh, Smith, uh, Stuart said, Perhaps while if you are doing the safety assessment of a product right, you may compare with the, with the adequate uh, con counterpart. And in case a product, uh, for instance, if you have a BT crop, you should not only compare against the, uh, the wild type or, or conventional crop of the same kind. You should also compare to the use of chemical insecticide. And perhaps if he, there in, indirectly you are assessing a benefit because your product is less um, it has, has less risk than the conventional or the or the counterpart. In, but when it comes to gene editing in particular, I think it's more valuable uh, to focus on, on the potential benefits, not as part of the assessment of uh, product by product, but in, but in, in the policy making stage. Uh, so we, uh, if we approach the, the, the benefits to the policy makers, perhaps they will um, make a stronger effort 
not to overregulate the products in general. I mean, the general benefits be used by policymakers to find the adequate regulation and not to overregulate uh, in general. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. Well, we are just one minute before 5 p.m. here. Um, Dr. Fritsch, what do you think? There's one more question which could be addressed or is addressed actually to all three speakers and that would also provide all speakers with the opportunity to make a sort of also a final statement at the same time. Should we proceed like this? What do you think? Yeah. Is that okay? So this is a question by Adinda Deshraiva and she refers to the title of our webinars and the question is to all of you do you see any new international disputes arising compared to conventional GMOs if the EU does not exempt genome edited organisms or will the same as for conventional GMOs will be repeated e.g. a World Trade Organization WTO dispute this was the question. So do you see a possibility of new trade disputes unless the EU exempts genome edited organisms from regulation? This is only a starting point perhaps for a final remark. So Stuart, you would like to start, okay. Sure, I, thank you, Hans George. I'm just gonna take a second and address the one question about the, the Cebus variety that was commercialized. So in Canada, the, the way the canola trade industry works is that any new variety that comes on that is a PNT has to, the developer has to ensure that it receives import approval or, or risk assessment approval in the key export markets. So China, Asia, other parts of Asia, Europe, Mexico would have, Cebus would have ensured that, that it had past the, the risk assessment system prior to commercialization. That, that's sort of the, the agreement that the, the coal industry has come to. So it, to turn to, to this last question, I, I think the challenge particularly for the EU is going to be given that there's, there's no testing capacity, they're gonna find themselves in a similar situation to what they were in 2007 and eight, shortly after they, they made sure that no, no further GM crops were going to be commercialized in the EU and they were scouring the globe for, for non-GM corn and soybeans for use as livestock feed and, and were quickly running out of sources. And I, I remember being at a conference about 2006 and there was a, uh, a representative from the Brazilian uh, Farm Association and he estimated that 80% of Brazil's corn and soybean exports to Europe were GM, whereas the the delegate from the Brazilian Ministry of Agriculture said it was only 10%. So, so I think if Europe tries to ensure that the gene edited products have to be the same way as GM and with no testing capacity, really the, the default position for the EU trade imports comes to reject if they can't guarantee that there's no gene editing varieties in a shipment because there's no other option with without the ability to to quantify and determine what percentage gene edited varieties might be in any shipment of corn or soybeans the default has to be to reject and and Europe would within a few months run out of supply or access to down the road not right away but but say in 3 to 5 years when more gene edited varieties are released that the supply of of varieties that would be acceptable into the EU for, for livestock feed could, could rapidly uh, be reduced and, and which would result in, in pushing up uh, meat prices across the EU. Thank you. Would you like to add something also regarding the question of international disputes? Sure, I, I, can, I can say something. I mean, I think it's possible that there could be international disputes. I would hope that it wouldn't get to the level of the World Trade Organization. Um, and I think that's probably remote, at least until a number of these products are, are commercialized and grown in quantities for, for export. 
Um, I do think that the companies that are exporting to the European Union are making an effort to get um, the, the proper authorization in the European Union. I'm wondering if for GEOs that's going to be more and more difficult because as Stuart just said of the problem with, uh, with testing and finding out if those things really are con from conventional breeding or, or GEOs and and there may even be a problem for the developers to get a unique identifier so that they could fit into the traceability system. So I, I think there could be problems in the future. And I, and I hope, like many, that the European Union will enact some sort of a provision, perhaps along the line that Leo, Leopoldina has suggested, to regulate these crops differently. That's my hope. And in the long term, maybe a, a, a different um, GMO regulation would be great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Margaret. Well, and last but not least, Martin also raised his hand. <laughs> Please, thank Martin, you. go ahead. In, uh, is, it, is it possible to, to, that this is leading to a trade dispute? Possible, yes. Probably, but this probability, I don't know uh, at this instance. But if in case, there is a trade dispute, as I said. I, I understand that the, the legal uh, base uh, of the EU defending itself in a WTO case is quite weak because, uh, among other things, the use of a very special GMO definition different from the international standard and also because there are uh, um, conflicting interpretations of that definition even within the, the official bodies of the European Union and, and its member states. Uh, but besides that, it's not just about possible trade dispute that the EU should think about revising or updating its regulation. It's also about all of the benefits, the social benefits, environmental benefits that these kind of uh, technologies could bring to countries outside of the union, but also within the union, if now uh, biotechnology sector seed companies are allowed to deliver these products to the agricultural farmers. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Martin, for this uh, last remark. Okay, so I think we are at the end of this session, also almost, almost at the end of the conference. And um, thank you so much all, to all of you for your exciting talks and also for, to all the participants and the audience for the very lively discussion at the end of these two days. And thank you also for these comprehensive and enlightening statements and answers. Uh, by the speakers. What I found interesting actually is how successful the Argentine and also the US system are when it comes to the regulation of GMOs, but also in particular the NPT organisms resulting from genome editing. When I look at the high diversity of organisms, high diversity of traits and high diversity of applicants uh, that was described by Martin Lema regarding the Argentine regulatory system. That is really astonishing. And I think the same applies to the United States. There's a similar variety of organisms, traits and applicants actually, when you have a look at the list of unregulated articles in the MI regulated procedure. Uh, what I've found a little bit concerning actually is or worrying is the uh, is Canada uh, with its problem of novelty and the question of legal certainty what is novelty what is the meaning of novelty and that uh, lack of legal certainty could even prevent innovation that was uh, one of the messages actually I think I got from your talk uh, Stuart that was also quite uh, interesting to hear so what we see in the end is actually that there's still that regulatory asymmetry between uh, our transatlantic trading partners, Canada, the United States, Argentina, and many other South American states on the one side and the EU on the other side. And I think the call should be a call for a more harmonized regulatory approach uh, globally, actually, and that would require more and enhanced regulatory cooperation among these trading partners. Um, so we got many ideas of, of, of course, how to adjust our system in the European Union. And what I see in all three countries here, Argentina, United States and Canada is that I think the regulation is much more science driven than in the EU. Uh, but let me stop here and thank you all. Thank you once again. Thanks all to you and uh, to the 
uh, all participants, discussants, and uh, the audience um, as well for all their interest um, and questions. And I think I will now hand over to the organizers, to Dr. Fritsch. And that also means I have to thank the organizers for the excellent presentation of this conference, uh, which I think was really a great task. It was an enormously great job. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, also, in the name of Leopoldina and TFG, the two organizers of this international conference, I'd like to um, uh, thank all the panelists and moderators for um, giving us their time and expertise and also the um, attendees for all their attention. We actually had uh, almost 500 attendees from more than 40 countries, very different time zones. Some people um, obviously got up in the middle of the night to see some of the presentations. Um, I hope we were able to shed light on a very different socioeconomic, environmental, political, and uh, last but not least, scientific aspects of this very complex topic of regulating uh, genome uh, edited uh, organisms or genetically modified organisms, as you might call them. Um, yeah, thanks again for your attention and all your questions. I'm very sorry that we couldn't. Uh, uh, give all the questions to the referees. There were always too many in each session and we, we had to um, sort them somehow. There were many people asking for the, for the slides of the presentations. We will have uh, all the videos and the slides uh, on, the, on the website of the conference. Uh, you can see or you can find the links on www dot leopoldina dot org slash en slash eu minus genome minus editing and also in the, in the conference program at the very end. Um, yeah, in the meantime, feel free to follow and retweet our postings on social media um, and follow our ongoing work in providing independent um, science-based uh, advice to policymakers and citizens. I hope we will see you again at some other conference uh, in person or um, virtually. And on behalf of the organizing team, I will want to give you our warmest regards and all the best wishes. And the conference is hereby closed. Um, goodbye and stay healthy. Bye bye.